who are not no fins guys have adopted this a lot of the top divers have adopted the idea no warm-up okay so let's try training that way and seeing if that works for us and that doesn't mean trying it once or twice it means trying it for a good period now here's just a little bit of philosophy that I'm going to throw in now um, very often champions are the worst people to learn from because very often champions follow the dictum of the victorious army there's a military axiom that says a victorious army never changes its tactics I think I even talked about this in my last webinar uh, years ago when uh, there was a question of should we use the monofin or shan't use the monofin I was discussing it with Umberto I'll repeat briefly uh, the exchange he said to me look uh, even though I was a butterfly swimmer and everything else uh, my uh, sponsors Egyib, Cressy Saab, all the rest of them have expectations from me every year and I don't dare risk uh, devoting months to perfecting monofin style working out which monofin exactly is the best for me uh, what stiffness etc 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 and this could set me back at least a year and I can't afford it um, so actually it was kind of the second rank or lesser divers that led the revolution the last people to abandon the monofin uh, the bifin at that period were Mrs. Uh, Pippin Ferreras, Umberto Perizzari and Tanya Streeter simply because they had achieved superb results with the bifid and uh, okay and it actually took um, Martin Stepanek a long time before he abandoned the bifin if he ever has done um, no I mean he uses a monofin for his very deep dives but Martin has done like William Winram some uh, 90 plus dives uh, with the bifin okay so here we are it's not always from the champions that we're going to learn the thing if you're not a world champion and this is, these are mainly the people that I'm talking to you have time to experiment use it find out what's best for you yeah go out on a limb say I'm going to train this way for X number of weeks and see how it feels give it a good shot if it doesn't work it doesn't work then we change gear if it does work you've had a huge advantage given to you now here's the ticket um, when we're doing static we not only try to reduce the number of repetitions in a single press static practice at the same time increasing the length of time that we're holding our breath we do it without packing and another thing that we do is that we do one practice on full lungs and another practice another day on empty lungs and very often even an equal amount of empty and full why because if we look at what's going on here if you're going down with a full lung yeah and a packed lung uh, everybody knows in theory you can go down uh, um, deeper before you hit residual volume before you have to fill and you can fill deeper uh, I dispute whether that's necessarily an advantage it's more the quality of ability you know, to recover air uh, I mean it's far better to recover air at 21 22 meters and be able to maintain that air in the mouth for a long period of time than a fill that may be less than perfect at 30 meters or 31 meters 
and uh, where your technique of maintaining the air in the mouth is not as good. So checks and balances here. So okay, how do we teach ourselves uh, this one? First of all, um, the first thing that we have to do is that when we get down to that part of the dive that we don't have air in our lungs and for somebody who's not packing that is going to take place earlier we better get used to the feeling the sensation of holding our breath on empty lungs hence the empty lung passages now physiologically it also makes sense because apart from I mean the system gets terribly spoiled if you've got a big sack of air here yeah, that uh, the system can uh, milk for air for quite a uh, considerable distance down. When the system has got to work to scavenge air, transport it more efficiently and utilize it more efficiently, then we'll call that, for the sake of argument, in layman's terms, the scavenging system uh, is what's going to be really essential for us at depth. And that, uh, we can get that feeling of comfort much better if we train a lot of really, I'm not talking about FRC, if I mean when I say empty lungs, please don't mistake me, please don't confuse it with the idea of FRC. FRC has very little use with me. I mean 2RV. Not reverse backed, but 2RV. As much as we can possibly get out without reverse packing. That's what I mean by uh, empty lung statics. And uh, you'll find that they increase much faster than you're capable of increasing your full lung. It's interesting very beneficial to do, I feel, to do both. Uh, as I say, let me go back onto that to recap to make sure that we've uh, nailed the points. One, for the sensation of comfort. Here let me emphasize something. Stress is a peculiar thing. It has an anatomy of its own. Stress is like uh, water building behind a dam yeah uh, little bit of discomfort stress a little bit more discomfort stress low light bit more stress uh, feeling of pressure or things craving is closing in a bit more stress the sensations that you feel going down, they can be interpreted as stress or you can make yourself comfortable with them. When they get to a certain point, uh, then it's really like um, the whole thing of Tai Chi. Beyond yeah, Tai Chi you have push hands. Yeah. Um, the one thing that you don't want to do in Tai Chi is tense up. When somebody else pushes you, uh, you're not there. Yeah, you don't resist. Uh, it's the same thing with the water. The water is pushing, it's squeezing us a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Are you still comfortable with this? Are you still comfortable with that? How about a little bit more? Am I still comfortable with this? And at a certain point, even though there's no conscious decision, your body may decide for you, hey, I'm not comfortable with this. And it tends to tense up as you would do if you weren't a Tai Chi master, yeah, if somebody's trying to push you. You tense up. The moment you tense up, bang. That's the end of equalization. Okay? So, the best thing we can do with dry training, it's not as good as in-water training, we all recognize that, but hey, what can we do dry? Is it worth doing dry? Yes, it is. 
Does it have benefits? Yes, because I don't need a partner to do it if I'm doing dry. Yeah? And I get used to the sensation of holding my breath for even considerably long periods of time on empty lungs. So I'm training myself physiologically and psychologically there. Okay, let me move on to the next thing. Uh, that's fine. Static. How about breath walk? Same thing applies. Uh, the classic breath walk, which I described before, should be pretty much a copy of uh, what you're going to be doing on a dive. Uh, I went into that before, so I'm not going to repeat it now. People, if they're really interested in my description of the breath walk, can go back and look that up. Enough to say that, uh, again, I'm working towards a single repetition of the breath walk on full lungs. Yeah? Ideally speaking, without warm-up, without packing, and without uh, too much ventilation before it. Um, just slightly over tidal ventilations as if you were going to sleep and then maximum one or two big breaths hold for your static period which let's say is a minute and twenty if you're going for a hundred meter dive and then you get up and walk preferably for two minutes still holding your breath okay um, now, what do we do uh, for the other side of the fence? For the days, we might do one day like that with a single repetition, going for a long walk. That's well over a 100 meter walk. Which, of course, we work up to gradually. Yeah, and again, I talked about that in, uh, when I described the uh, breath walk. But hey, uh, if it's worth us doing static on empty lungs, it's even more worth our while doing breath walk on empty lungs. Uh, but uh, we prefer to do that without the static phase. Just <sighs> exhale totally. Don't feel your cheeks. Walk. And uh, it should be one walk really to the end. Safety precautions about that are very simple. If you find that you're beginning to lose the straight line, stop. Don't go on. If you're beginning to get tunnel vision, stop. Because if you don't, then your dentist is probably going to get rich. So, uh, also, if you don't want to make your dentist even richer than he already is, and I don't know too many poor dentists in this world, um, I would advise, if you can, to do your breath walk, because it is an exercise that we push very hard. I would advise you to do it on either grass or sand, if you can. Uh, something that has a reasonably soft surface. I don't mean by walking up and down on the mattress in your bed. Forget that one. Okay, so um, let me go on from there. What's this? Um, can I pause you now or would you prefer to answer a question later on? Okay, there can be a short pause now, but I'm not going to answer the question. I'd just like to know what it is. Miss Divers is asking, is there any research made on people without spleen, especially for depth? Who haven't got a spleen? Yeah. I have no idea. I'm very sorry I can't answer that one. I really don't know the answer to that one. That is something that Erica would be able to answer. Uh, that I can only point you in the direction of uh, three of the major authorities that I'm familiar with. Uh, Erica Shagatai, Peter Lindholm, Eric Roskin, and uh, maybe even uh, Klaus Longer and uh, maybe somewhere between those uh, folk uh, they will have had some uh, answer or can po point you to somebody else who's uh, met that one but I'm afraid that's outside my 
it's you know, my uh, um, outside my knowledge. Um, to be a thousand percent honest with you, I didn't even know you could live without a spleen. Uh, oh, come on. But uh, okay. Now, let's go on to the next part, the next stage of training for depth. To avoid, remember where we're going here, we're avoiding trachea squeezes. The next part is we do an awful lot of training when we can get to the sea on empty lungs to depths of a maximum of 20 meters, and I mean totally empty, where you are, as I demonstrated before, totally emptying the lung, last air in the cheeks, on the surface, nose clip, pulling down a line, without neck weights, without a weight belt. Okay, those are the safety precautions that we have in that, and definitely with a leash. Okay, now when we're going a lot deeper in that, what is happening is that at first, you're going to find that you're either locking up, that means to say you've still got air in your cheeks, but you can't use it. Or you're finding that the air disappears. This is the more frequent one. And probably the one that's more relevant to you, Jeff. This means that the air is disappearing back into the lungs and you have, a, uh, you have an epiglottis issue here. The epiglottis is opening. Now, okay, when? Uh, your next remark that you made in your question um, about tongue position during uh, equalization. Should it be against my bottom teeth? Should it be this, that, or the other? Uh, basically, uh, we teach an equalization where the tongue doesn't move at all. You're only using your cheeks. And the pressure on the cheeks. Very often, uh, as Eric Fatah pointed out many years ago, and he was quite right, the uh, tongue, uh, sorry, the epiglottis and the soft palate are coupled. When one is open, the other is open. When one's closed, the other's closed, etc., etc. And he put it elegantly, uh, one of the arts of doing his particular method uh, was uncoupling them. That meant to say being able to maintain the soft palate in a neutral position and the epiglottis shut. Now, um, there are an awful lot of people in the world who can't do this, certainly not in the first 10 minutes, and that's usually the give up point with most freedivers, apparently. Uh, even those who have struggled with it, thought about it, concentrated on it, uh, it continues to be a bugbear. Okay. Um, First of all, then we have the question, do you want to pursue solving this particular issue? Or is there perhaps a way around the whole issue? Uh, we prefer to find a more elegant solution of going around the issue. Yeah, it can stay there as a white elephant. I'm not in the least interested in using a frenzel in combination with air in my mouth uh, at, at any depth beyond 30, 35 meters. I'm not interested in it. Why should I? It is so much easier, quicker, uh, more energy efficient, everything far more efficient just to use my cheeks for equalization. Now, there are exercises that help you master this technique. But, um, and some of them we've demonstrated before, the use of the balloon, uh, where you inflate a balloon and allow the air to come out of your nose. And there are all sorts of exercises with the balloon that help you do that. There are breathing exercises. 
with your mouth open, breathing from the nose, and then breathing from the mouth, and then breathing from both at the same time, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've done uh, separate webinars, or there have been issues on former webinars. But uh, basically, if you're concentrating on it, you don't need any of that. It's basically a question of relaxation and relaxation of the tongue. Most people, uh, it's who I've tried to teach this to, the question has been of unlearning, not of learning something new. Somebody who's never done any mouthfeel right from the beginning, yeah, uh, learns it in 10 minutes, boom. Somebody who's been doing a uh, frenzel uh, maneuver together with full cheeks uh, is frankly a nightmare to teach because he wouldn't come to me and worry about it if something wasn't working with it and he is so concentrated and fixated on it that when he gets it that it, every single time I can predict what he's going to say oh is that all it is it was so easy to learn so it's so, um, here's the ticket, it's um, very easy to learn, it's harder to unlearn and I strongly advise you Jeff not to even think about the position of the tongue. If you're doing a good frenzel and you want to go on doing a good frenzel, again the tongue is absolutely unimportant in that. Uh, the position of the, the front of the tongue. Everything is with the back of the tongue. Um, I'm going to try and see, can I borrow the light for a second? I'm going to try and demonstrate uh, what I mean about using a frenzel technique and having the back of the tongue. Now, I hope you can see this trouble with a webinar is it's not like having a whole uh, video studio and uh, good lighting and everything else. So I'm using a perfectly ordinary pocket flashlight or if you're British torch. Yeah. And what I do is this that I close my nose, I open my mouth completely and watch what happens in the back of my mouth. Uh, I hope you could see that. The front of the tongue is hardly moving at all. It's just lying there in the, in, the, in the bottom of the mouth. It doesn't have to be touching the top, the bottom. It doesn't matter. Everything happens when the back of the tongue pushes back and up against the soft palate. It's got a sort of rolling motion in the back of the tongue, up against it. So even if you were not using my method, Jeff, but going on, yeah, sorry. If you open your mouth normally, you'd be able to see. Okay, uh, Alina says I would have been able to see much better if I'd opened my mouth more. I'm not sure if I can, but I'll do the best I can. There it goes up, 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 up. Okay. The front of the tongue is completely unimportant and is not involved in this. If you can do a, f uh, a frenzel maneuver efficiently with your mouth wide open, yeah, then uh, you're doing it correctly. And anybody standing in the mirror can check out, uh, can check out themselves with a little flashlight. Uh, we sell these for, how much are they, Alina? <laughs> Um, and uh, they're a little they're a mirror and that and you can teach yourself friends or in, in half an hour anytime and teach a really good one. A lot of people do not have a good friend or technique. 
Okay, as I say, uh, first of all, you can improve your frenzel technique. And Jeff, here's the thing for you. You should not be losing air at 30 meters. That means, say, you're opening your epiglottis. So a lot of empty lung training, increasing the depth only very, very gradually, and only at the point at which you can equalize at the bottom. So in other words, if I can equalize at seven meters on the bottom and I've still got air in my cheeks, then the next time I can go to eight meters. And so it goes on. Increase only gradually, systematically, methodically and realizably. Um, quite a few of my better people get to 20 meters doing that. Totally empty or with a single lung fill that they're taking from the surface. And I will absolutely guarantee to you that the next stage, yeah, which is doing drops, that's what we do for deep water training first. Drops are head down variable where you're holding on to the weight yeah, and the, all the rest of the line is on the surface and uh, you hold on to the weight release the thing and in a head down position go down with the weight to the bottom uh, unless it's at 200 meters um, you have, of course, the rope tied off at the, at the correct depth that you want to get to, maximum depth. Uh, it's, there's a lot that you can do. This exercise has a lot of flexibility. What it's teaching you is to do the same thing that you did on empty lungs, but this time you're doing it on full lungs without packing, without weights, again, a weight of about 12 to 13 kilos is, for most men, fairly, even fairly large men, plenty to do that. Uh, and you drop with that weight, and uh, if you can drop to 60 or 65 meters, or even 70 meters, uh, <coughs> you pretty much got a very good idea of equalization at depth. <coughs> Sorry, beg your pardon. If you can do that, I'm getting a dry throat, it's very dry in, in a lot here. Um, the uh, thing about uh, dropping is being, being able to do that without having to top up. We have to clear this once and forever. This is a beer mug that used for water. Thank you. Not for beer, it's water. It's not vodka either, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm not going to get bored with the sound of my own voice, but I also get hoarse. Um, okay, so the object of doing drops after, on other days, yeah, when we're not doing empty lung work, is to take all the lessons that we've learned on empty lung, apply them to full lung in real drops, well, you also have the advantage of being able to uh, practice uh, pretty much the, the full ascent. Yeah, because although you're dropping without weight, and although it's going to be an easier ascent, uh, gradually with the drops you can also add little bits of uh, weight around your neck and uh, decrease the amount of weight that you're holding in your hand. That's further down the line. Anyway. The objective of the dial drops is first of all to get used to real pressure down there, not simulated pressure, because you're adding in another factor, time. Uh, a long dive to uh, 20 meters on empty lungs might be 58 seconds. Um, if you're doing drops, to 60 on full lungs, you can even hang there for a bit. I didn't say that. However, uh, when you've got all the safety in pace and the safety is briefed 
completely and all the rest of it and you're doing it with a counterweight yeah okay go for it uh, don't overdo it uh, however it's getting you used to pressure getting you used a little bit to narcosis and above all it's getting you used to the speed of equalization because you haven't got brakes the only thing that you can do at first you may need to do it is what I call slip and hold let the weight go a bit if you can't quite equalize now and need another second to do it and then hold what's that okay one second uh, so the next part of the thing is being able to maintain a single mouthfeel on full lungs real time to a minimum of 60 meters right uh, question uh, the question is from Matt Nathalina. okay Matt hi great hi, uh, hi Arnold. Was, terrific was, to hear from you I was training back in my 31 meter quarry yeah four degrees thermocline below 10 meters for the whole summer then you're a lunatic Matt okay <laughs> I got to the point that I can do repetitive dives to the bottom of full on full exhale with mouth fill on surface before going down. Is there anything else I can do tr to train flexibility in such conditions? I must say it's working because one weekend I went to another Polish lake where I had only three days of diving and without other preparation I've achieved 70, 80 and 90 meters. Depth limit is the lake. Thanks for your tips. Matt, that is, I hope the rest of you heard that. Um, Matt is apparently drilling holes somewhere in Poland or Central Europe and uh, disappearing 70, 80 and 90 meters having used this technique. I'm terribly pleased to, to hear from you again, Matt. I'm terribly pleased that that tip helped. Uh, it is uh, the king of all exercises in that and you can modify it as I say by adding little bits of weight until you are by degrees simulating your target dive so when you come to do your target dive it's a piece of cake yeah and I really wish you luck with that I know you're uh, doing this terrible teaching job or something and no, he's engineering. what I think he's engineering I think he's teaching engineering. Are you teaching engineering, Matt? I can't remember. No, I just anyway, I know that you're very busy at the moment and you said that this year you wouldn't be doing competition, which I consider is a great loss to other people in that. Um, one second, I've got a problem here. How do I... That's empty bursting into the... Can you uh, get hold of her on your yes. machine? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe Please, it's quick. Maybe it's yeah. Uh, sorry, we've got a few interruptions here. I've got a telephone call coming in on Skype, um, which I'm doing my best to ignore. Um, okay. So, the next stage that we go on to, before we're doing our discipline of choice, is uh, drops, which really cut across the board. It doesn't matter whether you're going to be doing... CNF, constant weight, or free immersion, drops are a superb training advice, uh, superb training for all three of them. Um, Jeff, back to you. Uh, it would need looking at in detail, uh, there is no reason that I can think of, of why you should be losing air uh, to that degree at 30. It can be um, simply that your technique of equalization, as you suppose, is not smooth. First of all, perfect your um, your frenzel. Yeah? Stand with the light in the mirror, look at what's happening with the tongue, work out what's happening, uh, and stop fretting about it. It should be just easy, quick, and instantaneous. Um, much better in a mirror when you're doing it to do it with a nose clip on. And if you can't find anything else, use one of those ones that uh, Speedo makes for uh, 
um, synchronized swimmers, which are very cheap and very easy to get hold of, and stand there with your light and just practice your your equalization till it's quick, easy, and you can do it with your mouth wide open, and it works every time instantaneously. That's the first thing. Yeah? And that will help you an enormous amount. Um, then you have to work out that, uh, am I tensing up at a particular depth? And one of the things that can really screw you up really badly is your head position. If you are going down, looking at the line, forget it, you're not going to equalize very far. If you're even glancing at the bottom to see, am I getting close to the plate? That's the point at which you're most likely to have lost your mouth fill. Okay, now we get on to the last part of the equation, which is air recovery should you lose the mouth fill. Now, um, there are two types. One is, if you like it, the leaky epiglottis, where the mouth fill is lost gradually. Your appreciation of having lost it may be sudden. Suddenly you come to the conclusion, oh, I don't have any air left in my mouth and I can't equalize. Um, my advice to you is go down to the same depth the next session, pay more attention to what's happening and seeing whether you're not gradually losing the pressure. This is just, if you like it, a slow leak and it's usually from every time that you're equalizing there's a small leak past the epiglottis, a small opening of the epiglottis every time you move your tongue, which is something that we're going to try and avoid. Okay, uh, so first of all, the whole point is to work out what's happening here. And as I say, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of empty lung training is going to be enormously beneficial in giving you the tools to understand what's happening here. Don't push depth with it. Push concentration. Concentrate on what's happening. Uh, Concentrate on not swallowing your air. Uh, concentrate on not tensing uh, your abdominal or diaphragmic area as you go down. Concentrate on not having any tension in the face or the neck as you go down. Concentrate on not concentrating. Now, hey, how about that for a contradiction? Good equalization is when you're not thinking about it. Good equalization, like good driving, is where we moved it over yeah, to the subconscious. And the subconscious has got control of the automatic pilot and the thing is happening by itself. The more we are concentrated on the equalization, there's a place for concentrating on the equalization when we're trying to understand what's actually happening. That's not when we're doing depth. That's when we're doing e empty lung equalizing, empty lung exercises in simulated depth at very shallow depths. There we may be concentrating at that point because we want to understand what's happening. We should get beyond that to the point where we're handing it over to the automatic pilot and we don't think about it. Because, uh, to be honest with you, the automatic pilot never fucks up. The conscious mind frequently does. So, uh, I don't know whether there's some other thing that I've missed in that. Um, if I have, uh, and you've got specific questions in that line, I'll try and address them uh, next week. Um, we seem to have gone quite well over our time, by a lot, I apologize for that. Uh, if you beat me over the head, I can stop yapping. Do we have any more questions? Um, no, just Matt mentioned that you did the dives with three kilo neck weight. 
in a sweet water. Uh, Matt, you're a, you're a maniac. Yeah. Um, Unless if there are salt water in Poland that I didn't know about. It's not Holland, Poland. Poland, I said. Oh, yeah, Poland, okay. Um, are you sure that it was neck weights and not one of those fancy Polish sausages around your neck? Um, I told you they're very good, by the way. Um, anyway, look, Matt, uh, from a safety point of view, I can't recommend people doing this practice with weights on their neck or on their body. Uh, if you are doing it, yeah, which I've got to disapprove of, if you are doing it, then uh, it means that your equalization is superb because you will be going down at considerably more towards the end of the dive than a meter a second if you've got three kilos on in fresh water. You're, even if it's, uh, I don't know, are you in a five or seven millimeter? I'm not sure about that. But uh, I imagine that you'll be going down very, very quickly and that means that you've got the technique perfectly. I think next time you're in warm, clear water you're going to be flying, my friend. Yeah, and I really, really sincerely wish you luck over that. Thank you very much for having got in touch. Uh, thank all of you for your questions. I'm sorry that there was one question I just couldn't answer concerning the spleen. Um, but... Uh, the spleen being removed uh, because of uh, leukemia. Yeah, the spleen uh, having been removed because of leukemia. Uh, I'm sorry, I really have no idea what uh, um, what would be the results of that, and I wouldn't like to hazard a guess that's way outside my area of knowledge. So I'm afraid you'll have to consult a medical expert on that one. Um, right. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for the people who weren't here for looking at this. Thank you very much, all of you, for not posting rude comments. The next webinar will be on the what? 25th. September the 25th. Twen 25th of September. Uh, we have ahead of us a whole week of holidays, crazy holidays. Yeah. Here we have a very strange holidays that go on for a month. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what the hell they're related to because I'm not religious. Uh, anyway, it does appear that Israelis don't like to work very hard. Because um, uh, it's a whole month of this uh, nonsense. Uh, certainly, uh, as I understand it, manages to mess up the school year quite, quite nicely. Um, so anyway, my best wishes to all of you. Uh, dive safely, always have a partner, and enjoy it like hell. And I look forward to seeing you all on the 25th. Good night. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye.